you knew we couldn't go too long without talking about blockchain. So uh, Will Polizzi, who's the uh, vice president for Markets and Markets, will be talking about how blockchain in food will turbocharge the $14 billion food traceability market. So by the way, I've been in the traceability market for a long time. I didn't know it was $14 billion. Why am I not rich? Why am I on stage presenting? So you got to explain that as part of your presentation, where the $14 billion is. So welcome, Will Palazzi. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if I had all $14 billion or even $1 billion, I wouldn't be here either. So, uh, but thank you for the, the thought. But I do have a 170-page report you can read and get all that great detail if you wish. So uh, thank you all for staying on, on Wednesday afternoon for one more uh, presentation. As I said, my name is Will Palazzi. I run uh, food and beverage globally. I'm also responsible for our business in Japan and a few other things. But we're going to talk about blockchain in the context of the food traceability market overall, which is something we studied. I have one slide that explains a little bit about who Markets and Markets is. Um, I'm happy I've made these slides accessible to anybody who's an attendee, so don't need to take photos. I'm happy to email it to you uh, if you wish as well. Um, we started this firm about 10 years ago, focused on emerging markets and emerging technologies. Uh, amassing some 30,000 different use cases. We have 7,500 what we call transactional clients who've been buying uh, reports from us. In the last two years, we've added what we call you know, annual engagements or subscription-based clients, about 350 of those. We have 1,000 uh, analysts around the globe, 1,500 people, 10 industry teams of which the food, beverage, and ag is one sub-segment of about 50 people. Uh, we provide an ecosystem of that written content, access to our analysts uh, around whatever topic you wish, and then a local global services for our clients around the world to help answer the questions and get their information they want. We focus a lot around the impact, their interconnections, and so hence blockchain and food, but we do blockchain and finance and blockchain and healthcare and AI and all of those things as well, but we find that's where our clients have the most need. Um, and we took on a $60 million investment two years ago from FTV Capital out of New York, and that allowed us to expand into places like Japan and Singapore, uh, London, Munich, uh, Tokyo, where I hang out a lot and, and elsewhere. So uh, from here, let's jump into this. So we pulled into the, the World Food Day theme in 2018 was, you know, our actions are our future, ending world hunger by 2030. Is it, is it possible? We think blockchain is one way to help us get there. I won't be so bold as to say that it will happen, but I think there's a lot that it can do. So broken my uh, presentation into three parts here, as you see, uh, conditions to talk about food and water security. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the trends that are in incubating this opportunity, globalization, international trade, and then specific blockchain technology and agricultural and food, and a few use cases uh, at the end of where we see some very promising signs here. So I'm gonna apologize as I look from up here to down there because my notes are on, on paper and not on the screen. So I uh, appreciate you uh, putting up with me here. So EMAs, I assume everybody's familiar with economically motivated alterations. Uh, for those not, you know, the three quick cases here, diluting ingredients while processing, replacing them with cheaper products, cheaper products without declaring them, and of course, intentional exclusion of those ingredients, but still declaring them on the label. So EMAs, and what does that mean? Well, from the CDC, or Center for Disease Control and Prevention, gives you some of the statistics around the number of illnesses, hospitalizations, and very sadly, the number of actual deaths. So this is not a, a small number. It's a meaningful, uh, serious uh, number, and it's something that we think uh, should be addressed, and we think blockchain, again, is, is one way that that can happen. So if we look next, we've broken it down here by major food ingredient category uh, involved in fraudulence for the last, what, 35 years. As you can see, uh, seafood, a uh, uh, hot-button topic as always, but alcoholic beverages and fruit juices being three of the largest uh, categories. Um, if you look at the other adulteration cases, you imagine, probably not surprising, again, 65% of substitution and dilution. This is not our, our information, as you can see, uh, as 
as a research company, we do a lot of primary research. We also use a lot of secondary research and we're very transparent about saying what is our information versus what is someone else's. You'll see more of our data as, as we move down uh, the presentation here. Uh, slide eight, um, some interesting information. Uh, this, I look for more updated information coming out of, uh, out of China, but 50,000 incidents in uh, you know, a 12 year uh, period, 68% food safety events caused by illegal events, you know, and a fraud cost of somewhere from 10 to $15 billion, according to our friends at the GMA. That's a very large number. That's motivating a lot of investments and you'll see where we see those opportunities specifically. Um, food wastage issues, uh, clearly um, any household of four losing between $275 and $455 a year is a significant amount of money. Nearly a billion dollars worth of ex expired food is, is a tragedy on, on both fronts. And a 660 billion pounds of food trashed just due to labeling systems. And finally, you know, on this, on this seafood issue, if these numbers are, are accurate, and there's, that does vary certainly by source, you know, 89% of the global population being overfished and 50% of it, again, if that's true, being wasted from the point it's, you know, fish to the point it gets to your plate. That, you know, all you got to do is match those two numbers and you realize you could solve it a tr tremendous amount of this problem by simply using and not allowing all that waste to occur. So from here, we're going to talk about the trends impacting this condition and globalization and international trade. So here we're going to talk about the EU and the amount, because it's the largest uh, economic region with the amount of uh, imp, imp, sorry, imports going on. And at a number right now of almost 93 million tons of food is coming in every year from outside of the EU and 93 billion worth going out. And you can see the uh, major uh, company countries that are responsible for the imports and for where the exports personally didn't realize that Switzerland was not part of the EU. I just assume, but they've, they've stayed agnostics. They are out officially outside of the EU. So a little learning there for me. But um, why this is important is if you look at uh, international trade and we will use uh, seafood, you can see the amount of frozen seafood being exported by country. You can see Russia at 10%, China at 11, uh, you know, the Netherlands there are not, the, excuse me, uh, Scandinavian countries, I think it's Den Denmark at 5% in the, in the US and elsewhere. Interestingly enough, the fastest frozen seafood exporters, Greenland tops the, the list there, but Denmark, Russia, and Mauritania are not uh, you know, doing too shabbily themselves. This again is growth rate year over year. So in terms of enablers, we're gonna talk about food traceability systems. So that's an area that uh, markets and markets and our food team has been covering for a number of years. We'll talk about what we see happening in the food coin ecosystem, which is an important uh, front runner in this space. And then the general global IoT, Internet of Things and food, beverage and agriculture, specifically in blockchain and who we think some of the market leaders are here. Uh, I'll forewarn you, we're not gonna tell you how to make $14 billion in this space, but we're gonna sh showcase a few interesting ideas that we think um, are important to pay attention. You know, as a, as a firm, our, our goal is to try to provide early insight to our clients on an op emerging opportunity and help them see those first signs so they can decide how to act on it. We don't ever wanna leave a client saying we missed out on something. And so here, uh, what we're talking about is the food traceability market, which is that $14 billion. Nearly two thirds of it is coming out of RFID uh, or, or, and well, the fastest growing, excuse me, Barco is being the fastest growing. Sorry, I've lost. Where's Where did I jump off on my slides here? Yes, yeah, sorry. So 10.2 billion of it is coming from uh, the barcodes market or 73%. And RFID is growing at a rate of 18.8%, the fastest grower. You know, for those who I'm sure are none are in this audience, this is how RFID is, is used in this functions. Not new, have been around for some, for some while. There's a full uh, report that backs this up. If someone has interest, I'd be happy to share more of it, but I was just trying to summarize a little bit here. So the food coin system, and I don't know, because I just arrived uh, last night, if much of this information has been presented, but 
as an early leader uh, in this blockchain and the food supply chain market, their goal is to eliminate you know, high cost and wastage by connecting local farmers and consumers, business and individuals through their thousand ecosystem farms. Um, we're by no means here representing them or advocating the solution or anybody else here. These are just companies that we've highlighted because they're showing interesting things. Over 4,000 registered users, five different continents, multiple countries, over 700 sellers in the US and Russia alone. Uh, those are split uh, equally, by the way. Uh, Fishcoin, and then we have uh, what's going on with MFish, 550 mobile operators in 135 countries, and then Fish Tracks, uh, which is the full chain of custody of prawns from aquaculture farms in Indonesia and East Java, you know, sold and served into places like the Grand Hyatt in, in Singapore. So very specific um, examples. And what is uh, interesting about this is I think they're trying to, you know, bring the money back to the farmer or the or the grower or something that we've seen is some what is it now 14 and a half cents out of the dollar is the latest number which is about down a cent of the total food dollars actually back to the farmer or the grower here and we think you know blockchain is it's described as the democratizer that helps those constituents actually gain a greater mark percentage of that dollar and and we think that's really one of the fundamental drivers behind this. This is current internet penetration rates, uh, according to the internet world stats, IOT and food and beverage. So um, this is our term in IOT, and I don't have time to go in the definition, but you can see here that that um, business is growing at 34.8%. Uh, and that's basically from 250, or sorry, uh, 45 million to about 40, sorry, 41.2 million to 429.7 million in 2023. That's where the market growth is happening. But what is uh, interesting here, and I'll get to a minute, is that's actually lower than other cases. So if you look at specifically blockchain and agriculture and food and supply chain market, here you can see those, those numbers again and the growth rate. But we broke it down into the four uh, industry uh, applications. So payment and settlement, product traceability, tracking and visibility, smart contracts, and then finally governance, risk and compliance management. So show of uh, the only audience participation question, which of these four sub-segments do you think is growing at the fastest rate? Anybody? Yes, correct. Product traceability, tracking, and visibility, almost 50% by our numbers. So uh, that, that's massive. And, and, and I'll forewarn you, before we get to the end of this presentation and you guys hit me with a lot of questions, I've, this team is 45 people. I have a subgroup that focuses very specifically on this. I will gladly try my best to answer your question, but I may have to defer to one of my researchers and get you a more uh, comprehensive answer afterwards. And again, I'm happy to do that via email, but I cover a lot of topics and a lot of areas of the, of the world and content. But um, so let's talk about blockchain specifically by region. So this is again, all backed up by a, a, a complete research report we've done. Not surprisingly, North America being the largest, but you know, growth is coming in Asia Pacific at a 53.1%. Uh, growth and in investment by lots and lots of companies, Cargill and Nestle are two of, of a multitude here. And of course, you know, the major supply of commodities are coming out of Asia and Southeast Asia. And you've got suppliers that uh, want to uh, take care of, of the growers and the farmers in these areas that, you know, because that's where the opportunity is um, and it's easy to go after. So we'll talk about those uh, in a minute here. So before that, one of the things I thought was interesting is looking at it by a stakeholder perspective. And as you would expect, food manufacturers and processors capture more than 50% of the blockchain market, followed by retailers and, and growers. Um, I think it, you know, the, the growers should, should be growing faster. I'm not sure we have an answer as to why that is other than, you know, again, voting with, with the almighty you know, dollar, uh, yen, or, or pick your currency. Um, but what is uh, interesting is that, you know, the, the growth in online 
smart shoppers is going to, you know, is driving a lot of this um, activity, which is why we talked about that internet penetration rate. And if you look at large versus uh, small medium enterprises, you can see they're also both uh, growing at pretty dramatic rates as this technology is coming down and we don't have time to talk about it today in, in price and deployment costs so that it is possible to do in very specific cases at without uh, massive investment because um, when you talk about looking to launch uh, pilot cases and engage suppliers and retailers in this kind of activity and growers, of course, uh, if you can only propose massive investments, that limits the, the level of interest. So some of the market leaders here, courtesy of our friends Ag Funder and, and Louise and others there, you can see the numbers and the companies that are getting more and more uh, investment here, going from 1 million up to, to 30 million. But what is uh, interesting here and this surprised me, and I don't like the way this graphic is represented, so let me try to explain. But the average deal size is basically only $3 million when you look at investment. It's not, 6% is up at $25 million, but you know, you've got 25% that's below uh, $3 million, closer to $1 million. So this, again, is a, a very approachable and entryable uh, market here in terms of uh, investment. So... So some of the use cases here, um, we talked a little bit, or I think this has been talked about with Providence and that one of the earliest cases here of yellowfin and skipjack tuna from seashores to, to plates, you know, tracking the entire thing using mobiles and eliminated doubles. But this one, of course, is unfortunately difficult to, to monetize because there isn't any clear thing, but they did state up front that, you know, this was as much about breaking down the barriers and collecting getting interoperability, getting people to talk to each other, developing some level of trust. Anybody been involved in any kind of dis uh, discussion, merger, acquisition knows that, you know, culture and trust are some of the biggest roadblocks to anything. And so from that perspective, I think it was greatly successful. I think this line, this is theirs, not mine, about, you know, getting to a premium payment for fish that is, is of a known origin and proven to be compliant with standards is where they, you know, one of the avenues to, to monetize this. How much will consumers pay and, you know, restaurants and uh, pick uh, the, uh, the buyer if they know the origin and, and they have compliance issues? Lots of probably great conversations going around the last few days that address that. Um, IBM and Walmart, sorry what happened with the colors here. I got a little out of lack with the, <laughs> the data, but, um, you know, the IBM Walmart example, um, between uh, the pork tracking in China, uh, what they did here, the mangoes in, from South to North America to ensure food safety, but um, they did, and not surprisingly, an excellent job. Look at six days, 18 hours and 26 minutes versus 2.2 seconds. I think that's a big difference, <laughs> to put it mildly. You know, that's almost a week versus 2.2 seconds, you know? This is two items in two countries going to two different locations. If we do the math, we start to get into the billions territory here, maybe into the, into the trillions. So this is only one example. Um, again, what we're trying to highlight here is there are some very, very promising signs. Um, as anybody who's involved in technology knows, betting when you place your bet is almost, if not more important than placing the bet. Nobody wants to be too early. Nobody wants to be too late. And everybody's company's situation is different. But what we're here to tell you is that it is happening and you need to pay attention. So Origin Trail tagged this uh, with Plantes and Montenegro to trace wine bottles. Uh, what I find fascinating, not just about this use case, is if you look into the data and we have for high priced wine auctions and the amount of people who are buying bottles of wine that are well over a thousand US dollars per bottle, the fraud rates are north of 35% because you've got people who just want to buy fancy wine and they actually don't realize they're getting something that costs $10 to put in a bottle and just got labeled and aged appropriately. And so I'm not so sure we need to worry about millionaires and billionaires overpaying for, for wine. But again, giving uh, consumers the confidence about what they're buying and that it was raised responsibly and, and 
follows all the rules regular is important. The same with ArcNet in Ireland with craft beers and QR codes. And the only other one I, I put in here trying again to cover large different parts of the world, but more focused on, on Asia, given that's where it is, is what AgriDigital has done in their store. And there's multiple cases down in Australia. But, you know, here again, the only I think consistency you'll see across all these outside of the Walmart is everybody's happy with the outcome. Everybody feels the level of accountability, the data collected, the transparency gives the visibility over ownership, improving security, uh, improving when and how to transfer ownership because you can match and watch it all the way through. But what you don't see in all of these cases, and, and this is one fifth of the cases we've looked at is very clear demonstrated value of this is what I'm going to get out of it. This is what my ever desired ROI will be. And that remains the challenge. But um, my uh, sort of conclusion to you here is that if you wait until that ROI is there and it's in one of the brochures that one of the exhibitors here is is handing out, you've you've waited too long because we do think, you know, it's possible to solve with blockchain. But what I would leave you with is, you know, three steps that I didn't put on here, but, you know, blockchain is, is real. It will impact the agricultural and food business. It's coming now, it's been active for three years now by my count. The early pilots are promising, but there's still more concrete data needed to really measure the impact. But what's interesting about that measurement, it's not just on cost savings, it's not necessarily on food savings or shortage or you know, waste and what's being supported. It's not just on resource saving to produce this. It's also on emission saving. There's so many different vectors and variables that you measure that all get monetized differently by the players in this space. So it's a little bit deceptive to just use the IBM, you know, to talk about man hour saving. That's great, but there's a lot of very intangible costs that are hard to pay attention. So I would just leave you with this, you know, when are you going to start your pilot? When are you going to get on the on the bandwagon? Because I think, in our opinion, uh, you're missing an opportunity here if you don't get involved. Wherever you sit in the, in the value chain, now is time to be having the conversation. So I will gladly take a few uh, questions here. Thank you for your time and attention. And I forgot to add my contact information if anybody wants it, but happy to hand out a business card. Please. So within the fishing industry, yes. is there an opportunity, do you think, for a branded type of blockchain so that there's a standardization? Or is this by each individual company just setting up their own blockchain methods? Uh, short answer is yes. We do think there is an opportunity here, and we think that's something that should be and what should be followed and, and perhaps, you know, uh, focused on. But what we've seen, and this is not limited to blockchain, but it's fairly consistent with most of these things, is that um, while standards are being created, there is also independent activities going on. And, and, and whenever we've advised clients to focus on just waiting for the standards, they tend to miss out on things. So I, I honestly think you need to do both because it's going to happen uh you know in a in a viral format on its own without waiting for any standards because the opportunity is too large and uh thank you for the uh opening the door for a shameless plug <laughs> because the next presentation is the global dialogue on seafood traceability is. which is all about uh standardization and interoperability so regardless of which blockchain or right. solution you're on uh using you know, globally recognized standards, including GS1 standards and other standards for interoperability between blockchains, between uh, legacy systems. So that's coming yes. up right after this. Perfect. Any other questions? So uh, in your slide, you had uh, that broke down uh, the different segments of the yes. food supply chain. Mm -hmm. So uh, retailers, manufacturers right. and uh, growers. Yes. Um, do you also have data on which uh, industry seg, you know, which parts of the food industry are investing? Um, yes, I do. I don't have it here handy, but I could certainly come back with that information. Yes. Yeah, because that was a question that came up earlier in okay. the week is. 
is who are the leaders? Like what, yeah. which industries are out front and actually trying this out? So sure. I was curious if you had that. Yeah, and one thing I would add on this data that I don't think I mentioned, you know, although blockchain food and blockchain is at, you know, under 50%, blockchain overall, we, you know, are tracking close to 70%. So you could look at it from that industry perspective that food and is a is lagging behind some of some of the others. What, what industries are the leaders then? Uh, I believe I want to say fintech, but I honestly uh, will stop myself and get the information. We have it in a report. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Sorry. We have it broken down by industry and subsegment. Does your research give any understanding of some of the limitations that blockchain needs to start to overcome to become entirely dominant in this traceability sector? Uh, certainly, yes. We can. Uh, we're not just uh, just here to pump everything up. In terms, we're quite happy to share the uh, the uncertainties and the risks that go with this. So, um, happy to have a follow up conversation with you and and put you in touch with the people in my team who can answer that question better than I can. But yes, absolutely, it is not without uh, risk. And I would say, from my uh, perspective, and I've been watching this for years. It, you know, it it got overhyped. It's come back down a little bit, and and now it's actually stabilizing and is on the same on the right track of where it should be. But it 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 did itself a disservice if it it is a thing we can blame by getting on the cover of every magazine and newspaper article, and the expectations were no longer achievable by anybody. Any. Any other questions? I'm curious uh, from your methodology of doing sure. the research. So how do you how do you get all this information? Sure, great question. So we have, well, there's it's a five point system, but I'll make this this quick. So the first every report we do, we conduct primary interviews uh, via phone or at conferences like this or video. So any individual report might have anywhere from thirty to sixty interviews over, and we're doing. 3,000 reports a, a year. So that gives you a flavor for the volume of it. Um, we also have a uh, our own machine uh, web crawler that sucks in two and a half million web pages a month in six primary languages. That That is then curated by our research team that gets compared with it. We also paid and use other databases. We're more than happy to compare our numbers. Uh, we put on 30 of our own events a year. So we collect a lot of data points there. And then lastly, the most interesting thing is the 95,000 questions a year we get from our clients. And so we use that at a, you know, at a very high level and, and anonymized way to tell us what's going on. And, and the people that are involved in, in these businesses running these teams are been in industry. So, but um, we are very transparent and anybody who ever has a question about the methodology or the way we got there, we will tell you. We, we don't use magic, we just use hard work. <laughs> all right. Great, thank Th you very much. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Enjoy the last few hours. <laughs>